we can be good. And mm. so um, on that note, uh, let us do so uh, to say to the many of you joining us from various places, time zones, possibly other days, as sometimes happens um, with these online readings where someone will be um, west of the Western part of the United States. Um, but to everyone, welcome. Um, on behalf of my colleague, Karen, who's doing the real lifting here um, on uh, for us uh, and myself and others at Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the Northwestern part of the United States. We are thrilled to be having this reading, a poetry reading tonight, um, two marvelous poets you're going to hear from. Um, and in the best form, this, of course, we do wish this was in person, but again, everyone's getting to join from different places by doing it this way. But one of the, at Elliott Bay, over the many years, almost 40 now that we've been having readings, including poetry, um, two things are really sort of wonderfully central. And one is to introduce a new poet, um, and sometimes one of their very first readings. And the other is to have um, a poet whose his work is so um, there with people that um, a, a new book gets, you know, anticipated, ordered in advance, um, and just and really welcomed. And in this case, also a poet who has her own Seattle connections. And so, in having um, Caitlin Scarano and Ada Limon um, in, the, in the roles, I'm I sort of put out there. Uh, Caitlin with her debut collection that's just come out, um, The Necessity of Wildfire, um, from Blair Press. It, uh, recipient of uh, the Wren Prize. Um, I think that's as in Carolina, Wren, because um, uh, Blair is down in the Carolinas. Um, and it was selected for this prize by none other than Ada Limon. And Ada has just had her sixth collection come out from Milkweed Press, Milkweed Books, um, uh, Milkweed Editions, actually, um, in Minnesota, The Hurting Kind, um, which I'll say a little more about each of them. But tonight, um, Caitlin is joining us from her home in Bellingham and Ada from um, one of her homes. She's kind of keeps Sonoma going, her hometown, but also um, like in Kentucky. So um, I think when Caitlin and I each came on to say hi to Ada, we were like, where are you, Kentucky or um, out west? So everyone's in the same time zone of, of the people you're gonna hear from. Tonight, you'll hear from both of them reading and actually um, it's gonna be a lovely back and forth. You're gonna hear, um, I think Ada's going to start, and then Caitlin. But you'll you'll be able to tell who's who um, with these books as they read. Um, as I say, well, let me say a little more first about Caitlin. Although I think you're going to hear from um, Ada first. But this book of hers, um, Necessity of Wildfire. Um, actually, Ada could say a lot more because she read it uh, to the editor who who um, actually put the book together. Ada's the one who read it most closely early on. But it's there's really intense, serious. Um, poems of place, of landscape, of personal kind of journey. Um, it's informed Caitlin uh, is originally from Virginia that she and Ada have sort of this interesting southern, rural southern, you know, mountain um, connection, but also um, out here in the West. And um, it, um, Caitlin also along the way, I mean, her educator, professor, a professor from um, University of Alaska in Fairbanks, which is part of her schooling, um, as well as spending. So she spent time in the far north, as well as uh, as far south as Antarctica, along the way, um, writing poems that have strong sense of place, strong sense of um, personal story, and um, and getting here and and getting through everything um, in a beautiful, beautiful book. So a beautiful book the way it's done, but also um, you'll hear in the poems she reads, and with Ada. Um, it's this book, uh, The Hurting Kind, which comes um, after the previous one, most recent, The Caring and um, Beautiful Dead Things, the one before, The Caring, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award, um, Beautiful Dead Things. I think I happen to be in New York at this thing where everyone gets dressed up at the National Book Awards. It was a finalist for that, um, along with the National Book Critics Circle Prize and the Kingsley Tufts Prize. I mean, these things were just even getting a, to be a finalist um, is, an honor. And um, she has book by book just um, built this extraordinary voice, um, which changes with each book, but also you say this is one of her poems. Uh, and again, place is strongly informed with them. Um, hum the human, but also the, the more than human connections um, of places and people and, and how everything is connected 
um, as we go along. Um, and the other part of ADA we'd be kind of touting and uh, is that, um, and we do claim, and we, we don't, can't quite say she's a Seattle poet, but she did some formative years undergraduate um, at the University of Washington. We were talking a little about that as, as you probably came in. So um, you will hear from them both uh, in, in good order. Um, Karen's been putting information on their books in the chat. Um, and please come get them. Uh, we have them both or you order them. Um, they will, um, and we know, you know, with poetry online, people say and do things in the chat along the way. Please do so. Um, I'll come back. I'm about to disappear. But I'll come back at the end um, and um, say say good night to everyone in the way we have to reluctantly do so when these things come to an end and we can't go all out together. Um, so that oh, the one other thing I would say about Ada too, because you get to hear her read these poems, but she is. Um, it's worth looking up, and I think Karen will have this in the chat. Um, a wonderful daily poetry uh, podcast, a five minute um, uh, piece called The Slowdown. And that is worth hearing. Now you get to hear them both in virtual aliveness. So um, with that, um, for all of us again at Elliott Bay, thank you for being here with us. Please join in giving a good virtual welcome and applause to two wonderful poets, Caitlin Scrano, but first Ada Limon. Ada. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> it is so amazing to be here. Um, I just want to say this book means a lot to me and it's such a pleasure to be here to support it and to be here to celebrate it. Um, for me, this tonight is really about this book and I, I just want to be uh, wholeheartedly in support of it and, and hope that everyone purchase it. It's beautiful. Um, it's also, I believe, the second book, not the debut. Uh, Caitlin does have a have a, a first book out as well. So, but um, what we're going to do is we're just going to go back and forth and have this uh, sort of poetic conversation, if you will. And if you see this light, I can't. I put. This, I have no idea where it's coming from, but it's like it's following me around in this beautiful way. So I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> um, hopefully, it's not bothering you too much. Um, and I'm going to start with a poem, um, which is actually the first poem of my book. The Hurting Kind, which just came out this week. Um, and um, Caitlin and I have actually a lot of similarities in our work, which I'm excited to talk about. But one of the things that we return to is our animals. And so uh, I thought I'd begin with the first poem in the book, uh, which is about a groundhog. Give me this. I thought it was the neighbor's cat back to clean the clock of the fledgling robins, low in their nest, stuck in the dense hedge by the house. But what came was much stranger, a liquidity moving, all muscle and bristle, a groundhog slippery and waddle thieving my tomatoes, still green in the morning shade. I watched her munch and stand on her haunches, taking such pleasure in the watery bites. Why? Am I not allowed the light? A stranger writes to request my thoughts on suffering. Barbed wire pulled out of the mouth as if demanding I kneel to the trap of coiled spikes used in warfare and fencing. Instead, I watch the groundhog more closely and a sound escapes me, a small spasm of joy I did not imagine when I woke. She is a funny creature and earnest, and she is doing what she can to survive. Thank you, Ada. I was taking some notes to prepare for tonight's reading and looking over your book. And the first thing I wrote was animals, exclamation <laughs> point. So yeah, I hope we can talk about it. And I, I also just wanna, um, thank Rick and Karen for coordinating this tonight. I want to thank Elliot Bay Books. I also want to say, you know, this is a huge honor for me. And if someone had told me a few years ago that you and I would be um, sharing this space, I probably wouldn't have believed them. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with a book, I'll start with a poem, Every Disaster Branches Out from Another. Once I threw my grandfather's favorite tabby cat off the back porch. She landed low, 
trembling on the bricks my grandmother had laid in a herringbone pattern a decade before. I can still remember how slick those mossy bricks were in the rain. The oak tree choked with ornamental ivy. Still feel the skin snag on the holly bushes where I tried to hide. Still smell the bird bath's bedded water. For years, I thought what he did to us was simply what was owed for trying to break the legs of that fucking cat. He caught me that day, twisted my arm behind my back and whispered into my ear, I give you this lifetime of fear, a throat full of bees. He had no idea the gift I would make of it. So moving, I'm gonna move over here <laughs> as the light moves across us. Um, God, what a poem. I remember when I first read that and that idea of um, how as children we can hurt when we've been hurt and what we do to sort of show that, right? Um, that was just a, such an incredible poem. Um, I thought I would sort of answer that poem with a poem of, um, or respond in conversation with a poem about a fish. The first fish. When I pulled that great fish up out of Lake Skinner's mirrored double surface, I wanted to release the tugging beast immediately. Disaster on the rod. It seemed he might yank the whole aluminum skiff down toward the bottom of his breathless world. The old tree of a man yelled to hang on and would not help me as I reeled and reeled, finally seeing the black carp come up to meet me, black eye to black eye. In the white cooler, it looked so impossible. Is this where I'm supposed to apologize? Not only to the fish, but to the whole lake, land, not only for me, but for generations of plunder and vanish. I remember his terrible mouth opening as if to swallow the barbarous girl he'd lose his life to. The gold ringed eye did not pardon me. No absolution, no reprieve. I wanted to catch something. It wanted to live. We never ate the bottom feeder buried by the rose bush where my ancestors swore the roses bloomed twice as big that year. The year I killed a thing because I was told to. The year I met my twin and buried him without weeping so I could be called brave. I love that one. This poem is called Spur. The night your father left for good, he slept in a cemetery, then set out at first light. You were five. Your God did not come, no beast with a halo of antlers to carry you on. That obsidian stone you coughed up and kept beneath your pillow, never staved off any loss. Every talisman failed you. The family collie wore a half moon into the cracked dirt, trying to get at the rooster when he tore open your sister's back along the spine with his spur. But she never reached him. She couldn't save anything from her chain. Your mother must have paused by the kitchen sink one morning and sobbed into a dish towel until she could hardly breathe. Then she collected herself and raised three daughters while her husband raised his body like a barn that had outlived its use. She taught you how to leave a man when he decides to shape himself into a cinder block and ask you to hold the rope. So good. It, the, my screen actually popped up and said, you are muted because apparently I was saying, I was, I was making a noise that the screen, the screen was telling me you're, you're muted. Um, gorgeous. Uh, I, it, that poem made me think of, uh, Again, I think if, if animals connect us, I think um, our interest and maybe obsession <laughs> with lineage um, 
and what is passed down, I think is really important um, to both of us. And so this is a poem um, that deals with that as well. Runaway Child. The ocean was two things once, in two places. North, it was the high icy waves of Bodega Bay, Dillon, and Lemon Tour. And south, it was the blue ease of Oceanside and Encinitas, umbrellas and a sleepy breeze. It took me years to realize those two blues were the same ocean. I thought they must be separate, must be cleaved in the center by a fault line. On a call just now with my grandmother, she mentions how all the flowers I've sent are from my garden. So I let her believe it sweet lies of the mind. She says she's surprised I like to grow things, didn't think I was that kind of girl. She always thought I was a runaway child. She flicks her hand away to show me her hand becoming a bird, swerving until it's a white gull in the wind. She repeats, a runaway child. Mercy is not frozen in time but flits about frantically, unsure where to land. As children, they'd bring us to the ocean, divorce, distraction, and summer. We'd drift with the tide southward until we'd almost lose sight of them, waving dramatically for our return, shouting until we came back to shore. Once, when she was watching us, I tried to run away, four or five years old. And when I got to the end of the driveway, she didn't try to stop me, even shut the door. And so I came back. She knew what it was to be unloved, abandoned by her mother, riding her bike past her father's house with his other children late afternoons before her grandmother would call her home for supper. Some days I think she would have let me leave. Some days I think of her shaking on the shore. Now she thinks all the flowers I've sent are from my garden, grown from seeds and tended. She gets a kick out of it. This runaway child, so overly loved, she could dare to drift away from it all. I'm thinking about how the first poem in your collection, the first poem you read, frames the whole thing in terms of survival and the relationship between running away, those who run away and survival. And it um, made me wanna read this poem about my sisters. I have two sisters. Um, it's called Nights Like These, I Think of My Sisters. Girls who live like flashes in me, crimson, rage, and eye teeth metal coils ready to spring, photographic flash of the snapshots my father took of us on the first day of school before his leaving, dazed by the light in his wake. Girl, be the flame who leaps the highest, the one that brings down the heavy velvet curtains, the one that catches the heavy velvet curtains on fire and brings down the house. Never know a mild winter, never be bell jar bent, don't be the rosewood they carve. Don't swoon, don't apologize, don't polish. We are the animals between us, not the men, not the little deaths. Don't be the silence in the cellar, the secret buried behind the white barn. All those years we spent in the forest, all those latch key days, don't let that pinprick hole in your chest grow to swallow you. Don't be the horse licking sugar from anyone's hand. Be the mare that bolts. No, be the land beyond the gate that compels her. You're blowing my mind, girl. Um, amazing. I also like our work is so connected. I keep thinking of like, I'm like, oh, I could go anywhere with that. There's so many poems that relate. Um, and that idea of the, the horse is, you know, it's hard not to, follow that for me, um, but that sense of freedom, right? Um, and I think, um, I think I'm gonna read a poem about that.
this is a poem. Um, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> you ever like get sort of stop like, I don't know, what am I, I don't know. It's about a horse, but it's also not about a horse. Um, but I think it's also um, about how to recover from grief. And I think so much in that poem um, about the sisters and, and sort of, the, it's, not a, it's not just a wish for them, but a spell for them. Um, and I think this poem has a sense of a spell in it. Um, the unspoken. If I'm honest, a full pulled chest level close in the spring heat, his every which way coat reverberating in the wind feels akin to what I imagine atonement might feel like or total absolution. But what if by some fluke in the heart an inevitable wreckage, congenital and unanswerable still comes, no matter how attached or how gentle every hand that reached out for him in that vibrant green field where they found him looking like he was sleeping the mayor nudging him until she no longer nudged him. Am I wrong to say, I did not want to love horses after that? I even said as much driving back from the farm. Even now, when invited to visit a new foal or rub the long neck of a mare who wants only peppermints or to be left alone, I feel myself resisting at any moment something terrible could happen. It's not gone, that coldness in me. Our mare is pregnant right now. And you didn't even tell me until someone mentioned it offhandedly. One day I will be stronger. I feel it coming. I'll step into that green field, stoic, hardened, hoof first. I love that one. So I could say that after all of them. <laughs> um, this poem is titled, When You First Ask If We Can Have a Child. I've seen you undress in the yard, watch rain turn to see steam and rise off your skin. I've learned not to tell you too often how overwhelmed I am by my want for you. While the dogs sleep, her sleeps, her tail knocks against the floor. And I think about how we cannot always have access to the happiness of those we love. If we have a child, who will raise her? Certainly not the ghost of a father I hardly spoke to. Certainly not the wolves you swear you see circling me when you happen to wake in the night. Think of where I came from. Think of the anger I've only recently set down beside a river seething with silt. There are rooms for this kind of grief. Some people fill whole houses with it. I leave strips of paper and fistfuls of hair from my brush for the flock of Stellar's Jays in our yard, but they won't take these offerings. They want me to resist the impulse to intervene. In the car one night, constellations turning, country road turning, I say, if we have a child, you will love it more than me. You don't deny it. The ringing of bells passes through the body and comes out as the sobs of a mother behind a closed door. But what if nothing is possession? Could I imagine a way out of myself then? When I spot the wasp nest under the eaves of our cabin, I wait for the sun to set and then spray it with poison. I watch how the nest foams, watch the wasp drop to the earth one by one. Later, I cannot articulate my guilt to you, but I try. If we have a child, who will raise her? The trees surround us on three sides. The river takes the fourth. Tell me you believe our bodies together make a jar that can still hold light. Tell me you believe in love without leaving, winter without an underside of bruises. The first snow of autumn falls and my heart crosses the river in the black mouth of a crow. Praise the th sorrow clogged throat. Praise the chain of howls that rip across the mountainside. 
I reach into the churning belly of the oil drum stove and pull out the baby you've been dreaming of. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. I was thinking about that, um, those questions sort of at the core of each core of it. Um, and now that repeats, like if this were to happen, what then, you know, that idea. And I'm so interested in that because I feel like there's so much of our life is that, is that questions of what, of what's next. Um, and so I think, I think I'll respond to this, which is a, which is sort of in some ways a poem that is trying to describe an indescribable want. <laughs> um, but then I think it's also trying to um, do a releasing of that want or maybe a surrender. Um, where the circles overlap. We burrow, we hunch, we beg and beg. The thesis is still a river. At the top of the mountain is a murderous light, so strong it's like staring into an original joy, foundational, that brief kinship of hold and hand, the space between teeth right before they break into an expansion of heat. We hurry, we hanker, we beg and beg. When should we mourn? We think time is always time and place is always place. Bottle brush trees attract the nectar lovers and we capture, capture, capture. The thesis is still the wind. The thesis has never been exile. We have never been exiled. We have been in the sun, strong and between sleep, no hot gates, no house decayed, just the bottle brush alive on all sides with want. We think time is always time, place is always place. I was taken by that one. I'm not sure what I want to respond with. Um, yeah. This poem is called After the Horses Are Gone. Your face is more mask than dreamer. There is no girl to feel inside your mouth, count your teeth. You sleep heavy and thoughtless as the stones you gave me when you wanted to know Earth's substance and structure. After the horses are gone, your mother calls, but you don't answer. Your father calls, but you call your father, but he doesn't answer. You shiver like a warbler caught in the rafters of an abandoned copper mine during a storm. Wolves still ask for each other, but we do not stand between their voices. Everything we individually witness has no witness. After the horses are gone, there's no one to blame. I stuff my mouth with glass, use it to kiss anyone who'll have me. They twitch and talk in their sleep. I save all of it in my mother's jars. After the horses are gone, you write out isolation in loopy cursive like a lover's name. I lift my talking head from my neck, wedge it between branches. Juncos move like mice in the end of season snow. Yeah. How many of us have felt like the horses are gone? <laughs> that is, uh, it's, yeah, incredible. I feel like there's uh, a lot of um, trying to pull those horses back to me on some levels. Um, but also that wonderful line, after the horses are gone, there's no one to blame. 
incredible. Um, I'm going to read this poem uh, that I think responds to that in a, a different way, which is that um, I guess the idea of of ghosts in some ways um, and and what sort of haunts us. And this is a poem um, for my stepmother who passed away in 2010. And um, it's a prose poem for Scythia. At the cabin in Snug Hollow near McSwain Branch Creek, just spring, all the animals are out and my beloved and I are lying in bed in a soft silence. We are talking about how we carry so many people with us wherever we go. How even when simply living, these unearned moments are a tribute to the dead. We are both expecting to hear an owl as the night deepens. All afternoon from the porch, we watched an Eastern tohi furiously build her nest in the untamed forsythia with its yellow spilling out into the horizon. I told him that way I remember the name forsythia is that when my stepmother, Cynthia, was dying, that last week she said lucidly, but mysteriously, more yellow. And I thought, yes, more yellow, and nodded because I agreed. Of course, more yellow. And so now in my head, when I see that yellow tangle, I say, for Cynthia, for Cynthia, for Cynthia, for Cynthia, more yellow. It is night now and the owl never comes, only more of night and what repeats in the night. I'm thinking about that line, how we carry so many people with us. And I also think, you had a line in this collection about how you cannot sum up a life. And I think part of that might be because how much we're comprised of all these other lives, who's here and who's not here. Um, and so that makes me wanna um, read, read a specific poem. It's a little, it's a little bit longer. Um, I went to graduate school. I, I haven't talked about this in a while. I went to graduate school with this really fantastic person whose name was Josh Fish. And, um, he was also an amazing writer and passed away a few years ago after jogging, actually, at age 36, his heart gave out. And I struggled to write about it for a long time. Um, but I have one poem that is in this collection. It's called, I Know We're All Sick of Poems with Deer, But Let Me Explain. Last night, a forest of hospital beds. I want to ask all these strangers, do you ever think every day you're getting closer to your death? Or do you wake up in the morning with hope crusted in the corners of your eyes, your teeth already grinning at the air? Grief is a very complex machine. It told me so itself, a matrix that takes years to navigate, a matrix that takes years from you like teeth. Dear Jay, I have a few acres all to myself now. You should see them. I'm sorry you had to turn so many stones while I looked on at a careful distance. The male human heart at age 36. Who knew, I guess, what can give out? It's true that I didn't mind the horses starving outside my window as long as they came when called. I had many apples going to rot. What else could I have done? I read about how the water in Lake Superior is rep replaced every 191 years. Remember the spot where I dove under and rolled was rolled by a wave and for a moment, I did not know what was up or down, what was past or present, you or him. That winter, the lake froze, trace lines of cracks, cracks in the ice colliding, the fractures in my body all met. In another dream, you're right in front of me, solid, tangible, with a dark beard and corduroy pants, I ask you about dying and you say, 
Let's go to the city I know. Then you disappear into a tangled forest and I follow, stumbling, ripped by thorns. You're always just out of reach, always just turning the next corner. Remember those children we watched while we ate ice cream on that green bench in Sault Ste. Marie. That isn't my favorite memory of you, not by far, but it's the one I keep coming back to. I took it, so I should have wanted it, but the sugar made my teeth ache. Every memory is two-sided, like the day we lay in the grass, watching ships pass through the locks. Distance is deceptive. It was sunny. The photos you took prove it, but the wind, or the wind and rain that day we met at the lighthouse, you wore a black sweater. I hadn't seen you in years. You looked younger, time doing its mirror trick. The scene draws us. We aren't ghosts, but we were both, we weren't ghosts, but we were both adrift, though only one of us knew it. When I reached the city you spoke of, it's been abandoned for decades. Every memory is two-sided, like the time you were driving and your Jeep hit black ice and spun out, like the time I was driving and my car died as we coasted downhill. All this foreshadowing for nothing. In a human dream, electric blue hydrozone, creatures blossom in Lake Superior's deepest water. Every memory is two-sided and your story isn't mine to claim. I run these dirt trails near my house. I think of you, I touch my chest, count my breath, so my heart keeps going. One day I came upon this mother deer and two fawns. They were tiny, spotted, legs so ready to give out, but they did not give out. Josh, you should have seen them. I remember when I first read that poem and just was so moved. Um, and maybe this is a good time to kind of ask a couple questions and we can, if we wanna maybe read another one at the, at the end or whatever, but I, I just feel like one of the impulses that you and I are, are driven by and I can feel it in our work as connected, even though you and I've never met in person, um, it does feel like there is a sense of honoring, but also a truth in the honoring that we wanna make sure we get that right. And I, that way, that idea that you keep saying that the two-sided memory. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, if you want to, <laughs> um, about, um, about what it is to write about a memory and also recognize that the memory is yours. Um, and not the other person's. Yeah, um, I was actually thinking about like that you noticed that line about every memory being two-sided and noticed how the line, that particular line repeats. I was thinking about reworking and I, I, thought, I thought in looking, I closed my book, but I opened it back up looking at this poem. I'm like, I'm pretty sure the sentences don't, have endings in this poem and and they don't um often my poetry does have punctuation yeah. but sometimes and i think in particular when um i'm trying to do a certain type of reworking like it's longer lines but without without the closure of a period at the end so it's like in this poem i i feel like i was trying in particular to tread and retread our, my memory of him, my memory of our relationship, and like thinking of um, coming at him, the dynamic between us, the loss, myself making sense of the loss, try, trying to think of it, like how many angles could I come at this thing? And although they're all fragmented, and I wrote about this in another poem recently, like thinking about um, witness and how, and this, that's an interesting word because it comes up in your book a number of times, but how, um, like our lives have meaning sometimes not necessarily by witnessing, but by being witnessed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think about, um, like he, do, he doesn't need me to affirm that he existed. Right. But so who is, who is the poem for? If I'm like looking back at the memories, um, it doesn't, he can't hear it necessarily. It doesn't change the situation. So what is the 
treading and retreading doing. And it's, I don't know that it, there has to be an answer necessarily. It's like even returning to the memories to sort of like cataloging them or putting them in conversation with each other um, and just kind of honoring the, the fragments of it, the sort of like holes in the story. But we, we were still there. We were still by the locks that day in Sault Ste. Marie. It still existed. It meant something. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, love, I love that answer because I think there's so much in your work that I admire that it resists um, a sort of easy clarification or an easy summing up or a sort of um, I am doing this for this reason. It, it works against epiphany in some ways. And I think that, that that to me is a real gift because I think so often and when we write about those we've lost or when we write about complicated uh, relationships and family or whatever, we're often seeing them in a very myopic way. And for me, I, I've, I really appreciate that idea that it is fragmented and that it's working against sort of making something perhaps even more important than it was. And I think sometimes that happens to us, right? We think, oh, I'm gonna sit down and write a poem about someone I've lost and therefore I'm gonna really sort of eulogize and, and dramatize a moment. And in this poem in particular, I really find that there is a, a level in which you're honoring the sort of the dailiness too of the event, the sort of, this is just what happened. I wish you could see this, mm -hmm. right? It's simple. And to me, there's a there's a really clean honesty to that that I appreciate in the work. Yeah, I'm wondering similarly how how does memory come up for you, or how do how do your poems interact with memory, or um, what do you think um, the role of witness is in particular from um, the perspective of a poet in our current times? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that like you, I write a lot about memory and I, I, I tend to trust my memory. Um, and I've, as I've aged, I'm more I'm interested in like, oh, the things that I get corrected on, or my brother will say, that's not what happened. Or, and I, to me, it's fascinating. I'm like, oh, how funny that I can remember something so clearly and then have it be turned around and be, and said, oh, no, that's not actually exactly the truth. Or I conflate, you know, four days into one or all of those things sort of happen. Um, and so I, I have, I think that because I, because I become more suspicious of my own view of the world, the, my own eye of the world, even though I love it, I, you know, I love looking, I love deeply looking, I love deeply remembering. Um, I think I am also very suspicious of being the only witness and feeling as if like my job as the poet is to record or that I have some sort of place that is um, uh, is somewhere high in the hierarchy. And I think I'm really interested in what is it to be the poet that is deeply looking, but also being aware that they're not the only person there, that they're not the only animal in the room, <laughs> that they're not the only thing that is uh, witnessing, right? What is it to have the birds watch you to have the trees experience your presence um, and to feel again that, that, that this uh, act of living is reciprocal and that it's not always about my viewpoint, <laughs> what I see, what I have witnessed, what I have experienced, but also what, have my, what is my impact on other things, on other people and how, have, uh, how can I honor people and things and animals in a way that feels truthful to their existence and not always in a, in, in a way that sort of manipulates them or transforms them into something that can be of use to me as the artist. And I'm really interested in that. Um, and I, I could feel myself sort of moving towards that even more so um, as, I, as I mature as a poet. And I mean, I say that, I know that I'm on book number six, but I'm hoping that I'll be a hundred and still writing poems and still, and still getting better, so, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. It makes me think of um, the poem, your poem with the Kingfisher, mm. Browning Creek, right? Like um, witnessing the bird, but also the bird, 
like being a witness to the birds anti-witness like these mm. these non-human beings there there's almost like this comfort and in their indifference right like there's isn't this like pressure for meaning the meaning that we have such an impulse to construct and i i, I do appreciate the way um the sort of quietly complex way that you handle non-human animals in your work um and i'm curious like why do you, why do you think there are so many animals like why do you feel drawn to it and is is it do you well i won't ask two questions in one question yeah no i love that and i love, <laughs> and you know it's going to come back to you um and i think we could both sort of explore this in in terms of animals um and i think that there is that sort of i've always been the kid that looks out the window i've always been that person even as a child much more interested in like sort of the trees and even right now I, I've closed the there's an incredible view in front of me but I've closed all the windows so the light's not in it but on this side there's house finches that are in an oak tree and they're swirling around and there's vultures that keep sort of hovering and it's so hard for me to not just kind of want to stare and watch and and, and witness um, and I think that it is that acknowledgement of that in the sort of observation of animals, that acknowledging that I am to an animal. And I think there is such a hubris in the human world that we're not animals, right? That we're somehow different. And um, I don't know, I think that the, the, the my connection to them is, is a, in some ways a way of also acknowledging my own um, animalness my own instincts, my own um, body as animal. And I think it's a way of realizing that not everything takes place in the mind. <laughs> not everything takes place in uh, the rooms of the brain, but in some ways uh, also is instinct is also like the need, the want, the desire that is, or, or the, you know, uh, negativity bias that our brains are wired for all those things um, and to kind of release that to surrender to that to acknowledge that so I'm not always so hard on myself um, but I too am animal I think that's part of it um, but I'd love to ask I would love to ask that same question to you in terms of what is it that you find in those stories about animals um, I'm thinking of the calf. I'm thinking about, um, you know, the birds in the book, the cat. Um, and how do they work for you? How do they, um, how do they arrive to you when you sit down to write? Yeah, I think there was some, some point when I was in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and somebody had said something about animals in my work. And it's so funny how we can be doing things and not see like yeah. what's right in front of your face. I was like animals in my work, you know, and then I, I was like hard pressed and still have been to find a poem that doesn't have like doesn't have some animal. It's like it was actually be very I'd have to be very intentional and it'd be very challenging to write a poem without animals in it. And so it's like I think it's important to not um, sort of. I think we can fall into these like poetic, like familiar poetic places or moves that are comfortable. And it's like, oh, that's worked before. So I'll turn to that. Um, but I'm not sure that that's what this is necessarily. It's, it's, I, I think like so much animals, non-human animals have been so present in my life and such an important part of my life and like how I understand the world, how I relate to the world. And I think it like, of course, this relates to identity and our families of origin, right? And I grew up in Virginia in the South. My mother was a single parent um, and we always had many animals, multiple dogs, multiple cats. We raised chickens, we had a goat for a while. And so I have all these like rich stories and interactions from my years when I was, when I was forming into the person that I am today that have to do with all these relationships that I had with like, the women in my family, but also all these other beings that we shared space with, you know, and what you were talking about, it made me, I wrote down the word relationality. And mm -hmm. I, I feel as if we're like, it's so hard for people not to exist in a way that we are like, 
the the protagonist in our own movie right yeah like I'm, I'm not sure how you don't do that because it's like right. not everything exists in the mind certainly but we can't understand what's happening outside of the mind without it being through the mind so it's like being an individual is like so lonely sometimes and I also get um, I feel like it's exhausting too to be the protagonist in your own story like you get exhausted with yourself and how like what feels so important is actually like it's no more or less important than any other thing than like what the what the like birds outside your window are doing or dealing with right now. And yeah. so I think that when I'm thinking about non-human beings and how their like lives are like happening around my lot life and it's like they're interacting in significant or seemingly insignificant ways, it helps me sort of think about yeah, this like very complex web of being that really is what life is not so much just like these, these sol solitary, like isolated individual experiences or stories. Yeah, I love that. And can I also just say, when you are honoring the human animal in your work and the legacy ancestors, um, family history, are those poems to you, I guess, well, how do I want to word this? Um, do you ever get worried about writing about the other, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, and, and have you had poems that you kind of are, are writing and not publishing or, um, or do you feel like, uh, you know, do you have the freedom to, to write anything, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know. I think this is like one of the questions that will like haunt me as a writer or, or like like hover over my life as a writer until the end. Um, and I don't know the, the answer. I feel like um, just asking the question, being asked the question is part of the work, like paying attention to the question. And like what that gets at is I think somewhat of an ethical dilemma, especially mm. when it comes to writing about those who are people in your life, right? Like, which I certainly do, because I'm writing so much about my family, like in my family's experiences. And um, I know that in poetry, we talk about the poet, right? Like that's myself writing and the I in the poems, that's the, the I voice, if it, the poem is in first person and how they're, they're not the same. They're not the same person. And I think some readers will like very, very naturally just sort of like conflate the two. Um, but I think it's like, it's, it's impossible for them to be the exact same because the poem is not exactly the experience that the poem is about. It's like, uh, uh, it's like its own thing from that experience, right? Like an experience of that experience. Um, and, but I do think it's, I'm, I'm pretty open about how the, the I, the speaker in my poems lies very close to me, like to who I am and that I am a poet who writes um, of the personal, right? Somewhat confessional poet. Um, and I think when we write about other people, it's all very contextual, right? Like it, whoever or whatever I'm writing about, what is owed or what set of questions I need to, to work through as I'm writing that thing and including the question of, should it be shared? In what way should it be shared? I think that always comes down to like the individual situation, the individual relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so for example, I feel like I owe less to those who have caused more harm to me, mm -hmm. to those who have disregard their, how they've shaped me is more about their disregard. Mm -hmm. um, whereas those who have, um, who our relationships are more close, more grounded in care, like mm -hmm. there's, there's a higher um, level of attention that I'm paying to that relationship. Like, I think there's a great, I mean, there's responsibility in writing about anyone. Um, but I, I feel a great level of responsibility in writing about the women in my family. And it is like writing about the generations of women in my family, whether that's backwards or forwards, like my grandmothers, my mother, my sisters, my niece. Um, it's, I, I just have come to terms or made peace with it in that I can't not write about it. Cause it's like, I can't not be a writer and I can't understand my life and my experience 
there's no other way but through the lens of them and my connections to them and their story stories and how their stories shape my stories. So it's like I I have to I have to like write who I am and I have to write where I'm from. And it's really about like um, asking the questions of like, what do I owe these people? How do I try to um, acknowledge the limitations of my point of view and allow for more complexity? Like I've, I've tried to, I think you mentioned something about like resisting epiphany. It's like, I feel like the older I've gotten and the more I've matured as a poet, um, the more I've tried to resist like the, these, um, the categories of good and bad or good and evil um, mm-hmm. and like make more room for yeah. um, like how we're all a mix of those things right yeah that's really that's really beautiful and I find that's very true um, I, I I similarly have that sort of philosophy in, in my own writing about that and I feel like there's a certain um, if I if I'm not ready to have the conversation in person then I may write the poem but not share the poem right or I may um write the poem and and start the conversation you know um but I but I'm I I think it's important that we remember that there are people in our lives that maybe have a different experience with our work and I I think that's a I think that's a something we don't talk about enough as poets because I think we're like oh you can write anything you have permission to sort of be free on the page which is beautiful But I do think sometimes we have this like, oh, if I'm writing about someone that I really care about, I want to make sure that I, that they understand that care Mm -hmm. um, and that comes across. So I, I, I see that in your work and that makes sense to me. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if maybe um, we should close, we should each pick one poem um, to close with. Um, And I, why don't I go first so you can have the last poem. Does that sound good? Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for joining us. This has been truly just an amazing evening. I can't think of a better way to spend a Friday night. Um, I think I'll close with this poem um, that deals with witnessing. And, um, And being witnessed. open water. It does no good to trick and weave and lose the other ghosts, to shove the buried deeper into the sandy loam, the riverine silt. Still you come, my faithful one. The sound of a body so persistent in water, I cannot tell if it is a wave or you moving through. A month before you died, you wrote a letter to old friends saying you swam with a pot of dolphins in open water saying goodbye, but what you told me most was about the eye, the enormous reckoning eye of an unknown fish that passed you during that last stitch defiant swim. On the shore, you described the fish as nothing you'd seen before, a blue gray behemoth moving slowly and enduringly through its deep fathomless North Pacific waters. That night, I heard more about that fish and that eye than anything else. I don't know why it has come to me this morning, warm rain and landlocked. I don't deserve the image, but I keep thinking how something saw you, something was bearing witness to you out there in the ocean where you were no one's mother and no one's wife and you in your original skin, right before you died, you were beheld. And today in my kitchen with you now 10 years gone, I am so happy for you. This poem is called Unvigil. No to the wood warping grief. No to this hollow gown of a bedroom. In a dream, my father says to me, I have eight months to live. Then he's the size of a jewel beetle and dies in my hands. This happens over and over. When I wake up, the bed is almost always on the ceiling. I cling to it, not kept by gravity, but the idea of gravity. 
the way a cat opens her mouth and makes no sound. I can go north now or nowhere at all. Learn the names of roving eye constellations, make their stillness, mistake their stillness for turning, mistake our turning for stillness. Lover, don't you remember? We had a few sons, but I buried them in the snow before their gills disappeared. You were too busy flooding our house with water that tasted of bruise. When your shame became uninteresting to me, I left. No to visuals, no to the endless sucking hole of human need. I don't want a beacon, won't be a beacon. You open a window to let in some air and a few years fly out like birds or smoke or sheets of paper. Just like that, they are gone. Your hardwood floor left soaked in daylight. Amazing. Really just beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here tonight. And oh, I really you. hope we can meet in person. And I yeah. thank everybody for showing up. This was like so fantastic. Yeah, I know. It's just, it was so lovely to see all these people in the in the chat. Um, yeah, this has just been gorgeous. I don't know if there's anything else, uh, Rick, if you want us to do anything I'm else. I'm only reluctantly coming in here because the two of you have just been so marvelous in the chat. <laughs> The chat has said so much of it because there was a responding to the poems, which were there for both of you. That that was beautifully done. The back and forth, um, which made gave each of you your own voice, but actually put it in this place where the poems were in, in their own air. That that kind of got it away from the individual person writing it, but you know it is the poem. And then the talk after we were talking a little beforehand about sometimes when you have an evening where there are poems and then there's other talk, and the other talk kind of gets away from the the level of of where the poems are and the two of you kept it on that incredible plane and if anything the, the conversation was at least as high as the poems you know in a way or at least in a way sometimes poems have that elusive aspect and the, the conversation felt a little elusive because you're because it was a talk it was it was the two of you and again that you two had not met before tonight um ada had you know, judged this book of Caitlin's uh, into in, for a prize, and and Caitlin has obviously read Ada's work, but this is the first meeting of this sort. So you two were just um, it was such a meeting and reading, and a lot of the conversation, a lot of bit of chats are proposing dinner parties and yeah. all that, and that that should happen when it can. Um, um, Caitlin is just got you. Well, you can go up anywhere, but Caitlin's coming down to Seattle at some point, and Ada, you got to come back and see family and. I love that. Grounds. And um, to everyone, I, one thing I do want to add, um, and Ada kindly corrected it a little bit, but I'll, um, Caitlin did have an earlier book of poems. And um, uh, in the book, uh, Do Not Bring Him Water, is published by Right Bloody back in 2017. And so, yeah, and, and we actually have it or can get it. We usually do is from um, there. Right Bloody is a wonderful publisher. So, didn't mean to slight that part of it, things. <laughs> but, um, always sort of catching up with things. But thank you both. Thank you, everyone who's been with us. I know everyone, er, what your comment of Ada about what a wonderful way to spend a Friday evening, um, that was said also like, wow. Uh, and we're on the West Coast, so we can still go all have a little yeah. more Friday evening. Um, it's still daylight, we, you know, so we're, we have that. So Caitlin, thank you. And congratulations again on your new book. And Ada, thank you again. Congratulations on your new book. And um, everyone else too, thank you. And, Good night and um, good reading. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such an honor. Love being here. Love Elliott Bay Books. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> good night.